All right, welcome back. Good morning. You know, sometimes I forget how differently my wife and I think about things until she like asked me a question like she did the other day. She, I came home and she said, Claude, I've been thinking about something. If you had unlimited amount of money and you could do anything you want, what would you do? She's been thinking about it all day. And I was like, is this a trick question? You know, is this like, am I supposed to feed orphans? And she's like, no, all the orphans are fine. World hunger, all this stuff. If, it just, if you had an unlimited amount of money, what would you do? And I'm like, okay, give me a second. And so what's funny is what immediately pops into my mind is this island. And it's a small island. In fact, it's like there's one palm tree. It's like as big as this stage. There's one chair, one, you know, Diet Coke, one table, one umbrella. And, you know, looking back, I'm so embarrassed. I'm like, where did my family go? You know, all it took was like two seconds and unlimited amount of money. My family, boom, gone, you know, it's me island. And I'm like, okay, I got it. I got it. And so I was like, what were you thinking about all day? She goes, I've been thinking about it. If I had an unlimited amount of money, I could do anything I want. She goes, I would get a pedicure twice a month. She goes, now what was yours? And so listen, I know our vision is to be real, you know, all that. I was like, pedicure, baby, nailed it. T pedicure is for two, right? There's no way I'm going to tell her about me island and my family disappearing off the planet, you know. Isn't it funny, like, how quickly we think about uh, escape. That's what we're talking about this weekend is this idea of escapism. You know, things that we run to, to just man, get away from the world. I got a bill one time in the mail, so much money, I went and took a nap. You ever had that happen? You're just like, I know what'll help this. I'm gonna go sleep this up. Wake me up when the feds come, right? I'm gonna need my energy for fleeing the country. Uh, you know, what is it about us and when something like that, I, I think from an early age, uh, we learned that for every boo-boo, there's kind of a lollipop. Does that make sense? For every, in, you know, pain in our life, there's some way that we can kind of medicate or self-medicate it. And the deal is, man, that actually, it works for physical pain. You need some medication to get through because your body will heal itself. Praise God, right? Praise God, you cut yourself, you take some medication, you numb your, you know, your pain until it heals itself. But this weekend, we're talking about relational pain. See, people pain doesn't work like physical pain. Sometimes it might be a word that cuts your heart. Maybe it's a person that broke your trust or maybe it's a relationship that's caused you relational pain. And re relational pain does not heal naturally and it does not heal with time. And you can medicate it and numb it, but you're just gonna make the problem worse because it's not gonna go away. Anybody ever been there? And see the danger of this one, the danger of this one you know, we laugh about running to take a nap, but the same muscle that it takes to say, man, I wanna escape from the world and go take a nap, I wanna escape from the world and go have a drink, is the same muscle that leads people to suicide. It's the, you're working the same habit, fully realized. See, last week we looked at anger. Anger fully realized will murder somebody else. That's what Cain did to his brother. It leads to the destruction of somebody else. But this week, Man, escapism fully vented in your life, fully realized it wants to kill you. It will destroy you. And what I love about the Bible is the Bible doesn't hide its dysfunctional people. We all came from a dysfunctional family. We're gonna look at the father, one of them right here this morning, Noah. Noah was the hero of chapter eight. And if you remember the story of the flood, uh, maybe you've heard this Bible story where God, there was so much sin and wickedness on the earth that in Genesis chapter eight, God says, I'm gonna flood the earth, but I'm gonna save one family, Noah and his family. And it says that Noah was a man who walked with God. He was a righteous man. And so God had him gather the animals. And from the time Noah was 500 years old to 600 years old, the story is about him building the ark and surviving the flood. It's possible it took him a hundred years to build the ark. But afterward he gets off and we're gonna see that the hero of chapter eight gets into a habit of escapism. He gets drunk, he gets naked. It's the weirdest story. And he ends up splitting his entire family for the next thousand years. The Bible, the Bible only has one hero and it's Jesus. And we all need him, even Noah. So if you have your notes, we're now turning to Genesis chapter nine, the last chapter in Noah's life. The sons of Noah, so this is right after the ark, the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And it tells you Ham was the father of Canaan because they still had their wives. So there's actually eight people total that lived through the flood experience. 
And these three were the sons of Noah. From these people, uh, the whole earth was dispersed and repopulated. Noah, after this, Noah began to be a man of the soil. In other words, after that experience, that trauma, uh, you know, remember he was mocked. Imagine having a job for 100 years, first of all. But then be, imagine being mocked at your job for 100 years. You're like, Fred, you know, you're going to drown. I'm going to watch you drown, you know. He's building this ark for 100 years. He's trying to save his family for 100 years. He's got this purpose in life. But afterward, it says he became a man of the soil. He's like, man, I need a hobby. And it's not that, not that big a deal. He's like, I'm going to be a gardener. Hmm. I'm going to plant a vineyard. It's beautiful. It's like Temecula, you know. Hmm. I'm gonna, this stuff's pretty good. I'm going to drink some wine. Hmm. See, it doesn't start out really bad. I'm going to drink this. I kind of feel funny. He drinks some more. And he became drunk. And then for some reason, people's clothes come off. When they, get, they start drinking, their clothes come off. He lays uncovered in his tent. Uh, and, you know, I can kind of understand a little bit of why Noah is going through this. I mean, if you think about what's happened, first of all, he was on this boat. It's like a zoo. You know, imagine a boat the size of this room with all those animals and your family. Anybody ever been on a family vacation, right? It doesn't, it's like eight minutes in and I'm ready to jump out. He was on this boat for eight months, all right? After eight months on the zoo boat with your family, you'd probably get hammered too, okay? So let's not judge Noah. Uh, and, 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 but think about what he experienced. You know, he watched the death of civilization as he knows it friends, people that he knew. I mean, he's probably suffering what we call post-traumatic stress disorder. He's probably having survivor guilt as he looks around and his family's the only one left. Uh, out of the 43, you know, the Holmes life stressors, think about how many of those life stressors Noah experienced just in this short amount of time. I don't, you know, change in job, <laughs> check, right? Relocation of your family, check death of a friend. Check, 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 check. Do you know that one of the stressors is great personal achievement? You ever wonder why people like Michael Phelps win eight gold medals and then sink into the great, you know, incredible depression and escapism? Great personal achievement. He saved mankind. Will Smith didn't save mankind. Noah saves mankind. And retirement is number 10. You know, he's got free time. Free time and isolation, it's not good for us. So he's laying naked in his tent. Sorry, this is a weird story. And there's this awkward walk-in where Ham, the father of Canaan, walks in and he sees his father naked. But then Ham does something that's sin for him. He goes outside and he tells his two brothers. In an honor-shame culture, this is dishonoring to the father, the patriarch of the family. So Shem and Japheth, they do what's right. They take their garment, they lay it on both their shoulders, they walk backward and they cover the nakedness of their father. And it says their faces were turned backward so they did not see their father's nakedness. And when Noah woke up what later from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. And then he reacts. Look, he says, cursed be Canaan. In other words, cursed be Ham's family line. And let him be servant of servants, he shall be to his brothers. Bless Shem, let Canaan be his servant. Bless Japheth, let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. What he does is he splits their family. And if you know the story of the Bible, the people of God, Israel, their, their enemies for the next thousand years are who? The Canaanites. Ham turns around, curses, and splits his fa family as a result, all because of his escapism. And then the rest of his story, that's the end of his story. He lives another 350 years. It's like a midlife crisis. When you live a thousand years, this is your midlife crisis. And he dies at 950. It's probably not the legacy, right? It's probably not the legacy that he wanted to leave. The alcohol of fame, first member. You know, I was thinking about this story. And if you're, you know, coming to church, visiting, not used to the Bible, this might be, Part of you might be like, that's kind of weird. I knew you guys were weird, but that's kind of weird. Some of you might be like, well, man, so? <laughs> you know, I mean, this wouldn't even make local news today, right? Local man gets drunk, takes his pants off, yells at his family. The cops aren't even gonna show up for that. Like, that's not even that surprising. Some of you are like, that sounds like Christmas at my house. 
every year. Somebody gets drunk, somebody's clothes come off, somebody yells at the family. And, and man, we're not even shocked. We've dialed our escapism up to 11 since then. Noah, you know, you, have you ever heard of Vegas, Noah? Right? Like we've got whole cities dedicated to it now. We have advanced our escapism to where everybody deals with it. All of us have some escapism available in our pocket. How many of you have a love-hate relationship with your smartphone? Do you know there's 40, 40 million people this year that bought dumb phones? Because they said, man, I need to cut, there's something that I need to cut this string. This phone owns me. You know, and we just escape while our kids are like pulling for our attention. Well, I mean, if you would have told me <laughs> in college as a single guy that one day I would lay in bed next to an attractive girl who likes me, right? And then I would re read tweets by Donald Trump. I, I would come so unglued. My, I would mail my fist into the future so I could punch myself in the face. That's what I would do, all right? If you'd have told me that I would es choose escape like that, but we've all done that. How many of you ever sat down to watch an episode on Netflix and ended up watching like half a season? No, oh, nobody? Yeah. And you look down and go, what? Where did this tub of ice cream? Why is there this empty tub of ice cream? Where, how did that happen? No, you watched the whole season. That's why you didn't raise your hand. Was, we've all done this. I talked to a friend of ours yesterday and she said, man, I was with a group of students in Italy and we were there and we had a free day in Italy and they stayed in their hotel room and watched Netflix. They didn't even see the statue of David. She just wanted to. But you know, we have allowed those things, but we've also allowed more destructive things to creep in. Uh, for some of you, it is alcoholism that's affected your family. Maybe it's affected you. It's something that you've turned to to self-medicate. Maybe it's a gambling, that, that feeling of just kind of that rush, even on your phone. I mean, we can do this. We can do these things anytime we want now. Uh, maybe it's pornography. You've escaped into a different world to find what you're looking for. But listen, it's about asking why. Why am I running to those things? Because we're trying to medicate a pain. We're trying to medicate a lot of times a relational pain that's went unhealed in our heart for a long time. It's gone beyond relaxing. Is everybody with me? This is beyond just a Sabbath rest and a hobby to trying to medicate something that only God can heal in you. And so I want you to write this down. We need to reject, first of all, reject the lies that escapism tells us. It keeps pulling us back in, it keeps pulling us back in. And we justify, I justify the same way you do. And I just wrote down some of the ways that I justify some of my escapism. I think, man, if I avoid people, maybe I can avoid being hurt by people. You ever see somebody at the mall and you go, you do a U-turn, pretend you're on your phone. It's like a shoe, because like, hey. you don't want to talk to somebody. You know, we think, man, if I just got away from all these wicked people, all these people. And what's funny is, man, Noah did it. Noah was the best at it, <laughs> right? God had just destroyed all the wicked people on the planet. And it still didn't resolve something. These are people who say, man, if I just had a new community group or maybe a new church or a new wife, if I just got away from people, if I just got a vacation, but you know what, your problem keeps following, it's gonna follow you. It's like Alexander, you know, the no good, terrible, very bad day where he's like, I'm just gonna move to Australia. Well, guess what? There's people in Australia. So there's probably pain. Another thing we do is we try to numb the pain. You know, for every pain, we have a pill, like in our world, we're used to that. And, and in physical pain, uh, you know, numbing sometimes can make you re-injure and have that pain indefinitely. It's not even necessarily a good thing with physical pain, but it will help you get past it. But emotional pain doesn't work that way. Relational pain doesn't heal with time. So self-medicating, numbing it, you need to ask why. You know, pain, pain is not necessarily a bad thing. God has given us pain as a dashboard light. You know, you real, you, pain is the indicator that something's going wrong. You ever have one of those dashboard lights in your car? If you, you've got a real problem when you put like electrical tape over it and just try to pretend like it's not there. You know, the, the dashboard light is saying, you need to look under the hood because there's something inside, there's something broke. Last year, my wife was uh, at the mall in like Orange County with our kids playing in one of those little play areas with one of her friends. And uh, there's another grandma who was there playing with her grandkids, but this is like Orange County grandma. So she's like 43 and looked like she was dressed to go to the club, you know? And uh, she's there playing with her kids. And eventually the Orange County grandma comes over to my wife. She kind of limps over 
And she goes, excuse me, I'm so embarrassed to bother you guys about this, but will you look at my foot? And she's obviously limping her foot, the heel of her foot's red, it's swollen. Uh, my wife says, actually, it was pretty, looked pretty gross. And she comes over and she's like, would you mind looking at my foot for the last two weeks? I, two weeks ago, I went to the club with some of my friends dancing, which I, all I hear is, man, you probably got a little drunk and your shoes came off. What is it about alcohol and your shoes just fly off or your clothes fly off? Anyway, she said, will you look at my foot? And my wife said it was discolored. And I love my wife though, this is vulnerable. I mean, how brave is this woman, right? For coming over and saying, look at my foot. And I love my wife. She's like, come closer, bring it closer. <laughs> and then she looks at the heel, this, you know, this lady's heel. And my wife goes, well, you know, what is that? And in this disgusting, like infected foot, this lady reaches down and she starts to pull on her heel. And she starts to pull out an entire toothpick from the heel of her foot. <laughs> I know this is gross, but hang with me. My wife goes, where did that come from? <laughs> and grandma goes, I don't know. And my wife said, listen, you need to go to what's called the urgent care, okay? <laughs> because you don't know what else is in there. <laughs> you know, did you lose some keys or anything else? Uh, <laughs> And it was the most disgusting picture. I remember my wife telling me, I was like, what? A, like a tooth, how do you get a tooth? How do you get an entire toothpick in the heel of your foot and not know it? You know, for two weeks, she's walking around taking medication because somebody will give her a pain pill to, to walk around on that. The same way, the same way, man, we walk around with stuff in us. Listen, this is why you need a church like Sandals Church. You need a place where you can come and say, there is something infected. There's something disgusting that I need to ask your help with. And you need a community of people that's a safe enough community that says, come closer. Sandals, is a, Sandals Church is a place where we say, you know what, come closer. Because you need other people that can help you. Say, so you know what's causing you pain? Maybe it's this right here. Maybe it's this forgiveness right here. Maybe it's this relationship right here. Maybe it's this thing from your past. And sometimes you can't see that on your own. You with me? And, and listen, if you are stuck, if you feel like, man, there's, a, there's a, some escapism in my life that's taking its toll on me, it's mastering over me, and you feel stuck, on the back side of your notes, the bottom of your notes, there's a link at our church, move.sc forward slash help. We have te a team of people that can help you get unstuck, help you see what you can't see and help you begin the process of figuring out what is it that's causing the pain. Because listen to me, pornography is never the real issue. Alcoholism is never the real issue. It's not, that's not the escapism. The escapism behavior isn't usually the problem. It's man, what's causing it? What is the pain that's causing you to medicate? Because here's the good news. You've, you've wired your brain to think that you need that escapism. You can untrain and create new pathways in your brain in 90 days. Did you know that? That's how hopeful this is. That's how close you are to being free. You are 90 days away from being free from any of those behaviors. But until you figure out what the toothpick is and say, God, will you help me get rid of that and forgive and release that pain? you'll go right back to something else. But don't you love our church, that it's a safe place, that people can say, man, come closer when it's disgusting, amen. <laughs> the next thing we do is this. We all tell ourselves this, well, I can manage it. I can manage my medication. Don't, you know, I take meth, but I do meth, but just in moderation, right, you know. Uh, and, and when I say manage your med, medication, I'm not talking about the medication a doctor prescribes. My wife takes medication for her anxiety, things like that. Some of us, we need medication and it's a good thing. So physiologically, that will help you. Does everybody understand? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what we self-medicate with, the destructive things that we run to that, are, that kind of numb the pain in our life. That's the medication that you don't need to play around with. Let me be honest with you. This is the reason why I do not drink at all because I'm not good at moderation. 
Anybody ever oversleep? Probably this morning, you just, whoops. You know, that hour went quick. Anybody ever eat more than they plan to, right? Like, I'm not good at moderation. Why would I want to take on something deadly? You know, the, and, and nobody thinks this is going to happen to them. This is, in Taiwan, this, this happens all the time. Last year, there's a guy in Taiwan, online gamer, went into a little game cafe, you know, internet cafe, plays for three days straight and dies. Didn't, he drank very little, didn't eat anything three days straight dies. You know what's shocked me about this story is that when they go in to carry out this guy's dead body from the internet cafe, you know what the other people playing, the other gamers did? They go. Because you know what they're all thinking? It's not gonna be me. See, that's that's the thing we tell ourselves. Well, it's not gonna be me. And people around you are dying left and right from alcohol, from pornography, adultery. People around us are dropping left and right. And what do we all tell ourselves? It's not gonna be me. It's like those people that get exotic pets. You know, it's like, oh, it's fluffy. And they get all surprised and fluffy eats them, right? You know, know, that's that's what that thing does, right? You you know, we get all surprised like at SeaWorld when there's there's an attack at SeaWorld. You're like, no, Tilly, Tilly did that? (laughs) The 12,000 pound killer whale? You know, you're riding on the nose of Tilly. Like, it's not going to be me. He's got 56 four-inch teeth. They're like daggers. You're like, they're not there to smile at you. He's just waiting, right? And everybody thinks, man, it's not going to be me. Look at Galatians 6. It says this, don't lie to yourself. Oh, man, I'm on, I'm on the nose of Tilly. Don't lie to yourself. It's like mocking God. You will always reap what you plant. Those who live to satisfy the sinful nature will reap decay and death. This one, this one will kill you. Now, everybody that's had a bad day has said the next one. But man, Claude, I deserve this. Like, dude, I I deserve this. You know, unfortunately, guys, the sitcoms have kind of made this out to be the normal guy and we've lived up to the sitcom stereotype. And and man, I just wanna challenge our men. We gotta gotta come home from work ready to be a part of our family, not escape from our family. And uh, and I've been guilty of this, man. You know, you you didn't create a vineyard, you create a man cave, whatever it is. Um, At the end of the day, man, after dinner, the kids are all my responsibility. I said, man, I'll take care of everything. Bath time, getting dressed, yelling, screaming, all this, all this stuff that happens at your house. You know, sometimes I'm so angry at them. Like, but we try to read the Bible, every, you know, three or four times a week, not every night. Sometimes I'm so angry. I'm like, let's read the Bible. But then I try to lay in bed with them and we talk with Brownie and Frog. And it's the, it's the sweetest time. I wouldn't want to trade that for any other escape, any Netflix show, man, because they'll talk to Brownie and Frog about anything in, the, in their life. And man, it's ironic to me that Noah spends a hundred years building an ark to save his family and then steps off of it and escapes from his family and splits his family. That's what, it, that's what sitcom manhood has done to our families. Now, listen, some of you, you've experienced great pain. And, uh, and I don't want to minimize that. I recognize that in this room, some of you have been hurt and wounded very deeply by people in your past. And, um, and you've said, man, I, I feel like I deserve this. We have a girl that I've known since college. She's on staff with us. Her name's Carrie. And uh, Carrie was married for four years. And two of the years she was married to her husband, her, they were battling his brain cancer. He had a tumor, they had it removed, but it turned aggressive and it took his life about a year ago. And, uh, but afterward, Carrie told me that even in the, you know, in the middle of that, what was interesting was people told her, you know, you should indulge in this, you deserve it. You with me? You, you should go ahead and, and go ahead and do what you want over here because Carrie, you deserve it. And here's the danger with great pain. Sometimes great pain for some people can become their great excuse. It's the first story they tell you because it's their Disney pass. In other words, you can't, I, I, 
I deserve to do this because I was hurt. You can't fire me because I've been hurt. You can't, those rules don't apply to me because of my pain. And for some of you, giving up that by forgiving and releasing that person is giving up your Disney pass. That pain has become your excuse. And God's asking you to release it. The last thing that we do is we say, well, man, it's not gonna hurt anybody. As if we could kind of draw a circle around our sin. And say, well, man, this isn't hurting anybody. This is just my private thing. And this is only me that knows about this or only me, you know, this only affects me. Listen, everyone, nobody sins in a box. Your sin eventually will affect other people around you, even your absence, especially escapism. Man, if I escaped, I would miss everything good about my kids. Every good moment about time with my kids at night, everything they've learned from the scripture, every spiritual conversation we've had, every one of those moments, if I escaped, I would miss that. Your sin affects other people. About a month ago, uh, my wife, she'd had a rough week. I said, you know what? Why don't you take the afternoon, just rest. You stay home, take a nap. I'll take care of the kids. I'll do whatever, you know, like I'll pick them up from school. You know, so you just stay at home. I'll get the car seats, got them in my truck. You know, like I'll take care of the kids. The only thing I have to do is make a phone call today. And she's like, oh, is it that one phone call? And I'm like, yes, it's somebody I've been putting off for like two years. And I don't like talking on the phone. I definitely don't like having difficult conversations on the phone. So when I do, I like to go shop. That's my escape. I, I can just window shop. If it's really bad, I'll buy something. It could be a toothbrush, you know, but it just, it's my reward at the end of the day. Mocha Frappuccino. I talked to a tough, you know, had a tough conversation. I deserve this, right? And she's like, are you going to shop? I'm like, yeah, I'm buying a pair of shoes. She's like, oh, it's like a, a pair of shoes phone call. And I'm like, yeah. And I had some Christmas money. So I had the phone call. It went horrible. So I went to the van store. I'm like, I, you know, and I'm like, I am buying a pair of shoes and I'm fully now in me mode. Right. And I'm looking and I, they need to be durable for, for riding. So I'm looking at these, but then I start looking at a little more expensive shoes, a little bit more than my Christmas money. And I'm in there for a while. And then I'm like, well, man, these are really durable, but they're like twice as much, you know, so looking at more expensive shoes. This poor kid probably brought me like 15 pairs of shoes. And I'm like, man, there's, it's pretty empty in here. And he goes, yeah. He goes, it's about to get crazy though. I was like, why? He goes, well, it's after three o'clock. School just got out. Hmm. I go, hmm, school. Kids, school just got out. Hmm. It was like coming up from the bottom of the pool, you know? Hmm, what? It was like, kids, school. I forgot my kids. I'm picking up the kids at school. I throw the shoes at him and run out the door. He's like, let me hold these. I'm like, no, I'm never coming back. And like, I run out of the store and I'm running through the mall and I'm trying to call my wife and I'm trying to call the school. Have you ever tried to, you know, in the movies where they're running and talking on the phone? That doesn't work in real life. You're like, beep, you know? So I'm like, Siri, call my wife. And Siri's like, I'm sorry. I cannot understand deadbeat dads. And I'm like, come on, Siri. This is serious. And I'm running. I'm like, cuss words, cuss words, cuss words. I get to my truck in the parking lot and I'm like forever away from our school, you know? And you can imagine at three o'clock what traffic is like. I, and so I get in my car. Now I'm sinning against everybody. You know, like I'm driving like my kids are going to die. Uh, the only problem is all y'all drive like that. So I'm stuck behind every crazy California person. And I just, I had a long drive. Me and God had a long drive to the school. Because I'm like, man, how'd that happen? You know, I get there. My kids have been there so long. There's two chairs in the office. One kid's laying over the chair backwards and the other <laughs> kid is under the chair like it says shelter for the night, you know. It's just, <laughs> I felt just all the shame. And I just was like, I am so sorry. Like I let my wife down, I let my kids down. But you know, there was this drive where I'm like, how did I get here? You know, we do this all... An hour ago, I told myself, I wasn't gonna let myself do this again. And you say, man, how did I get here? Right, how did I get this far? Did you know that some of these things that you use to escape, some of these things that you run to, it activates a part of your brain. You've trained your brain to say, I need this to survive. And out of survival, your brain shuts off the brakes, the front part of your brain that tells you when to stop. You're driving without brakes. You're driving without any brakes. You wonder, how do I run over so many people? You got no brakes. You look and you wonder, how do intelligent, smart, logical people allow things to go that far? It's because they're driving without brakes. They've trained, their, there's no guard on duty. And so listen, your sin, 
everyone is at risk. Everyone moves into risk around you when you move out of reality. You hear me? When you move out of reality, everybody around you moves into risk. And Noah's escapism puts his family at risk. And that's why when Ham walks in, the problems start. Ham walks in, his son sees his father's nakedness and he reacts by going out and sinning back against his father. I want you to write this down. I need to re resist reacting to the sin of others with my own sin. He goes out and puts it on Instagram. I'm gonna shame my father. I'm gonna tell my brothers. He tells half the world. You realize that? That's a joke. There's eight people. He tells half the world. You told half the world. Noah curses him back. You know, I see this happen all the times in relationships where people, we call it triangulating in our family, where people triangulate against someone else. It means when I have a problem with you, instead of coming to you, I go to Fred. And I say, Fred, have you ever noticed this about this person? And they say, well, no, not till you said that, but now I do. And I start, to, I start to recruit people to my team. And I see people do this all the time. Misery, you know, you've heard misery loves company and they'll create it when they need to. And we create it around us before we ever go to that first person. And listen, if you will stop people from triangulating. When people come to you as the second, when you go, no, that sounds like a you and them conversation. That's a line. That's not a triangle. You need to go talk to them. If you will stop it, you will heal so many of your relationships. You will stop so many just destructive things from happening in conflict for you. And that's what Shem and Japheth do. Look at Proverbs 17, nine. The second part of it says this. He who repeats a matter separates close friends. That's what Ham does. He goes out and repeats this. He spreads it to others. He sins against his father. He triangulates, but Shem and Japheth, they reject it. You remember what they did? Look at the first part of Proverbs. But whoever covers an offense. Do you remember what they did? Shem and Japheth, they decide, you know what? We're gonna deal with the actual problem and we're gonna cover our father and they take their garment and they walk backwards before he wakes up. You with me? This is immediately, they don't wait till the next day. They immediately cover him. They do it unconditionally. They don't wait for him to sober up. They don't wait for him to apologize. They don't wait for him to make things right. He's not even awake and they forgive. They restore his honor. They cover him. Do you know that's how the Bible uses the word cover? It's he who loves, it covers a multitude of sins. It uses it as forgiveness. Look at Proverbs 10. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. If there's a pain in your life that's causing you to escape, there's a biblical response to it. It's to cover it is to forgive it. And one of the reasons you need to forgive past pain is because you live in a world with 7.5 billion people, there's more coming. And medication, time, it's not gonna heal your wound, it's just gonna collect them. Forgiveness is the only thing that can heal and you need to get those out <laughs> and healed because there's more coming tomorrow. And here's how you do that because Jesus did that for us. Jesus entered into the tent of this world for you he took his garment, which was perfect righteousness, and he laid it on you before you did anything good. While you were still asleep, while you were still dead, while you were still a sinner, he laid forgiveness and righteousness on you and me. And then he asked us to turn around and do that for others. I want you to write this down. God will give me real escape when I cover others in forgiveness. Colossians 3, 13 says this, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Do you keep short accounts? When people hurt you, do you keep short accounts with them? Do you forgive quickly? Do you go to them quickly? The reason you need to learn to do that is because there's more coming. You know, I'm... I'm not that great at like text messages. It drives people crazy. My little red dot, at one point last year, I had 350 like unread text messages. I like it because it makes my type A friends just freak out. You know, they're like, ah. 
But my email, I'm totally different, man. I keep, I move things quick because there's more coming. Man, I file, I delete, I respond. I try to deal with those emails as fast as I can because there's more coming tomorrow. And I try to keep short accounts in my email. I try to keep short accounts of people. About two years ago, Matt preached a sermon on forgiveness. And I remember sitting in the back and God was searching into my heart, searching through my heart. And I realized that there was, a, there was a relationship that I hadn't fully covered, I hadn't forgiven. In fact, there was an email, a painful email that I had literally filed away. And it wasn't just filed away in my laptop, it was filed away in here. And you know what God asked me to do? He's like, I want you to delete that email. And I was like, no, man, I gotta go back and go through the language. Of, and God's like, no, you don't. You just hit delete. This is unconditional. You just cover it. Just hit delete. And man, it took everything I could do. But can I tell you, man, to this day, I can't remember a specific detail about that email. Can you imagine a time in your life where the person who's hurt you most that you can't imagine, you can't remember a specific detail about that event. Can you imagine a day where God has healed you so completely? In fact, I actually reached out to that person just to get coffee when I went back through this year because God's brought me that far and God can do that for you. God can do that for you because some of you, you don't have an email, you got a whole folder that has somebody's name on it. You got a hard drive. You're carrying around hard drives of images and videos and replaying those memories. And God is saying, man, you can be free from the weight of that today. The reason you escape is there's something infected inside of you that needs to be released. And you go, no, I gotta, I gotta go back through those, I gotta go back through those emails one by one. I mean, those were all, no, you don't. God says it's, it's called select all. You just control all. Just like I forgave you, you can delete those today. And that's what I want our prayer to be. So what I want you to do right now is, I just wanna ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. And this is a time for all of us. We're getting ready to go back into the world where we'll be distracted, we'll have our phones. We're gonna go right back into life. But for the next few seconds, would you bow your head? I wanna pray. Because I want to... I want God to show you who you need to forgive. And some of you need help. It takes two people to cover Noah. Did you notice that? It takes two brothers to hold both sides of that cover. Anybody ever try to make a bed by themselves? Man, that fitted sheet, God bless you moms. That fitted sheet is from Satan, all right? That should be a CrossFit workout, making a bed by yourself. The fitted sheet, yeah. Some of you need help in doing this. And listen, this is gonna be our prayer. God, I need you to take the other corner I need you to take the other corner of this. Will you bow your heads? God, I pray for our church, the men and women that are here, even just visiting maybe for the first time. God, this is heavy duty stuff. But God, I believe you wanna set some people free today, not just from their escapism behavior, but from the pain, the wound that's deep down that's been causing it. And so would you show us right now, right now, God, would there be a face? Would there be a name? And by your spirit, would you give us the grace to forgive and cover them? Because God, you covered us when we were at our worst. You covered us while we were still sinners. God, would you help us today, right now, to cover that person in Jesus' name and not look back. To turn our face the other way. And even next week, if we begin to remember that we would say no to that lie, we would say, I covered that in the name of Jesus at Sandals Church and I'm walking away from it and I'm choosing to be healed. And God, would you heal us? Would you heal your people as they choose to forgive the way you forgave? And God, would you set us free? Would that with some people in this room, I pray that we'd be released today. We'd be released from that and released from escapism, God, so that we can live fully to you, fully for others. And God, that's our prayer and we pray it in Jesus' name, amen.